You're listening to the SSPX Podcast, and welcome to episode 48 of the Crisis in the Church series. Whether you've seen every episode of this series so far, or maybe you've just seen a couple, or maybe none of them, if so, welcome, this is likely the most important episode that we have done so far. In the next hour and 20 minutes, Father Wiseman is going to break down the entire crisis into four simple questions. If you answer yes to the first, then we'll move on to the second question, and so on. By the end, if you have said yes to all of them, well, congratulations. You hold the same positions that the Society of St. Pius X does. Think of this as a choose-your-own-adventure book, except it's about your faith, and the stakes are infinite. All the episodes that we have referenced in this episode are listed here, as well as in the comments and the notes for your review, or if you want to dive a little deeper. So, let's join Father Wiseman, and let's take a position on the crisis in the church. Welcome to our second to last, I think, episode on the crisis in the church series here on the SSPX podcast. Father Wiseman, good evening. Hello, how are you? Good evening. I'm doing well. Thanks, Andrew. How about you? Doing fine. Thank you for joining us. Great. Busy, a busy guy uh, teaching at the <laughs> seminary and traveling for a mission. Uh, so we're catching you before you start your weekend duties right. uh, at Mission Chapel. So thank you for taking the time to go over this with us, Father. Um, today we are going to kind of take a holistic view of all of the episodes that we have done these past 47 episodes, Father. Uh, and this episode is titled Taking a Position on the Crisis. Um, right. What are we going to be talking about today? Yes, yeah, so I thought we should maybe just give a little introduction to this episode and point out that if we look at the whole series of the crisis podcast, the Crisis in the Church podcast, we've really been trying to give an apologetics, so a defense for tradition, and more concretely, a defense of the position that the Society of St. Pius X holds in the face of the current situation in the church. And unlike a regular course in apologetics where we would defend the truths of Catholicism, we're not trying to defend Catholicism as such here, but rather we're trying to confront a problem that exists within the Catholic Church which we have called the crisis in the Catholic Church, the crisis in the Church. Mm -hmm. And uh, the society claims that essentially this crisis is the triumph, and it's been a triumph that's been in some manner institutionalized, so it is held in some way by even those in a position of authority in the Church. So it's a triumph of what? Of modernism. So an institutionalized triumph of modernism. And we call it a, a crisis, first of all, because it seems to threaten the very life and the existence of the church as we know it. And for that, we can mention, calling back to St. Pius X, who spoke against modernism. He says this about, about the modernists, that they, they lay the axe not to the branches and the shoots, but to the very root, that is, to the faith and its deepest fibers. They proceed to diffuse poison through the whole tree, so that there is no part of Catholic truth which they leave untouched. So this is why it's a real crisis. If modernism has taken a hold in the church herself, then it threatens the existence of the church. And we, we say that it's inside the church, it's internal, uh, because this is a problem that we see in some manner professed uh, either itself or its consequences by, again, those that hold positions of authority in the church. And Pius X warned us about that very clearly when he said that the modernists, the partisans of error, he says they are to be sought not only among the church's open enemies, but in her very bosom. So within her, we, we St. Pius X saw uh, these, these enemies of the church of her mm -hmm. position. And so the purpose that we want to fulfill here in this particular podcast is to explain a bit from a from a high-level view what we, the Society of St. Pius X, considers to be the right position to adopt in the face of this crisis. And in order to do that, we're going to very simply 
summarize the whole series, we could say it that way, in a in a list of four questions. Okay. And these these four questions, they proceed logically one after the other. So after we answer one of them, then we move to the next and so on and so forth. And I just like to lay out, first of all, these four questions, because I think they give the, the again, the framework, not only of this episode, but of the whole series, really. So the very first question is the first question we asked in the whole series, and that is, is there a crisis in the church? So that's our, our very first thing that we have to ask. If we answer yes to that position, to that question, then we can go to the next question. And the next question is, well, what is that crisis and what is its source? Or more specifically, is the root of the present crisis to be found in Vatican II and the liturgical reforms, especially as characterized by the Novus Ordo Mise. Okay. So is this the source of the crisis we're seeing right now? And of course, in the, in the crisis series, we examined that the origins of the crisis all the way much further back than just Vatican II, but most proximately, what is the cause? We claim that it's Vatican II and the liturgical reforms. So if you answer yes to that second question, we proceed to the third question. And the third question is this. If that is the case, should we reject, not only privately but publicly, should we publicly reject Vatican II, at least its errors, and the Novus Ordo Mise? And should we do that even if it puts us into an apparent opposition with the Roman authorities, with those members of the church that are trying to, to push these things on us? So that's the third question. And again, the Society of St. Pius X answers that question in the affirmative. Yes, we must publicly reject or publicly refuse to accept uh, the errors of Vatican II and the Novus Ordo Mise. So if we answer that third question, yes, then we proceed finally to the fourth question. And this question asks, well, if all of that is the case, then ought we to con continue to recognize as Catholic the Roman authorities, those very authorities who are responsible for, for promulgating and implementing Vatican II and the Novus Ordo Mise? Uh, should we do that to the extent, for example, of negotiating with Rome? Should we do that to the extent of naming the Pope in the canon of the Mass? Should we do that to the extent in, in recognizing the authority of the Pope? And so on and so forth. And again, this question, the society answers again, yes. We need right. to still recognize the authorities in the Church. We need to still obey them as long as what they command does not threaten or endanger our faith. So if you answer these four questions all in the affirmative, your position is the same as the position of the Society of St. Pius X. And I think that it's important to, to realize that we, uh, well, as the first question will indicate, we kind of have to take a position here. We have to think something right. about it because we want to be Catholic. I also want to note just before we, we maybe dive into a bit more detail on these questions that uh, in this podcast and, and really in all of the podcasts, we have been primarily speaking to our fellow Catholics. So those people who, who are Catholic and why do we talk to them? We speak to them because we want to show them a danger that exists today, and that danger is going to attack their faith. And because we want to, them to live their Catholic life fully and in an uncompromised way, and since the faith is so essential to that, because without it we cannot be pleasing to God, as Scripture points out, therefore it's really in this spirit of charity that we want to, to speak to them. So it's not, it's not, sometimes it sounds very polemical what we, what we do in our arguments, right. but it's not primarily uh, polemical. It's, it's not as if we, we condemn everybody that disagrees with us 
as if to say that they're heretics and we should just throw them out of the church. That's that's not what we say at all. Um, in fact, uh, while some of these positions can go to the point of heresy, um, n it's true that, that this crisis is a very confusing question. And because it's a very confusing con question, it has a lot of complexity, um, we have to realize that some people can hold a different opinion than us and still be in good faith. Now, we think there's a certain danger in those positions. You may suffer a detriment to your faith, and that's primarily why we want to, to, to speak to them. We want to address this. And I'll just mention in passing very briefly, in the history of the church, there have been other crises, other um, catastrophes even, one of them, for example, the, the Great Western Schism, where um, first you have two popes and then you have three popes. Um, and and we, f we find people on, on all sides of that question, even well-intentioned people. And we don't think, theologians don't think that they were necessarily schismatic or separated from the church because they held that. They were in error but they weren't necessarily uh, outside of the fold of the church because of holding that position. Um, nevertheless, we do need to make clear what the error is because there's always danger in error. So what we want here is, again, a spirit of charity. That's, I guess, what I'm saying. And even, especially this episode, it's to, to lay out very clearly the position of the society and why we hold what we hold, uh, why we think what we think. So we want right. ultimately to do what St. Paul said. We have, to, we have to do the truth in charity. You know, we have to be doing the truth in charity, holding the truth, but not abandoning that uh, virtue of charity. So Right. That makes sense. Um, you, I don't see any pitchforks or torches behind you. Right. At yeah. least not yet. They might be yeah. in that closet, but. Yeah, all right. that's right. <laughs> so no, no pitchforks I, I checked beforehand. So, okay. All right. Well, so, let's go ahead and launch in. Sure, sure. So the, the first question then, Father, um, and again, this is episode number one. We've talked about this, but again, just one. to kind of recap and put this all together, uh, yeah. let's start with that question again. Is yeah. there a crisis in the church? First question, is there a crisis? And the way I want to do this uh, layout is with every question, we're going we're gonna to be Thomistic again. So with every question, we're going to present some possible opinions that uh, answer the question negatively. Then we'll present the reason why the society says that the answer must be in the affirmative, yes. And then we'll try to say something specifically to uh, those other possible opinions. And again, okay. it's impossible to be um, uh, to say everything in this episode. We would just be saying everything we just said again. So right. I have tried to kind of summarize here. And so sometimes we'll, we'll move pretty quickly, but it's like, you got to go back to the episode and watch it in more detail. Sure. Um, so first question, is there is there a crisis in the church? Some possible answers besides the question yes are just, oh, I never thought about it. That's one thing to say, well, what are you talking about after all? And we do meet people that are like that, um, that say that. And then another possible answer is, well, actually, no, everything is just fine the way it is. And those are kind of the other positions. And we want to present now, though, why we say the answer to this question is yes. Why do we say there is a crisis in the church? Um, and again, we've had a whole episode on this, but just to summarize, I want to say one thing first of all, though, and that's a very a, a point I found very helpful is just the, the etymology of the word crisis. So where does the word crisis come from? It actually comes from a Greek word, and the Greek word originally means the turning point in a disease. So you have a disease, and then you have this critical moment where the patient is either going to uh, recover or continue going downhill and, and, and die from the disease. And so that's more or less the etymology of, of crisis comes from this vital point or state that can mark either one direction or another direction. And in another aspect of its etymology, the word crisis just talks about, just means 
a, a, a judgment. So the result of a trial, a, a decision that's made. In other words, it always has this sense of being a turning point. Which way is it going to go? And I find that that's helpful talking about the crisis of the church because we don't think that things are hopeless, that things are just, well, this is the end now. The church is divine. She cannot entirely disappear from the face of the earth. We have our Lord's promise for that. Nevertheless, she is suffering a disease and she is, she is sick. And we're at a, we're at a crucial point, a turning point in her history. And therefore, even by that etymology, it's something we have to respond to. Mm -hmm. So what are the, what are the signs that the crisis, uh, the church, excuse me, is in this crisis, is in this, um, uh, is, is suffering a disease? What are the signs? Well, first of all, and as I think uh, Father McFarland mentioned in his first episode, we see a large-scale loss of faith among uh, people who call themselves Catholic. So many people who, who say they are Catholic do not believe basic truths of faith and morals. And again, we gave a lot of... Um, a lot of statistics in that first episode. Uh, I could give more here. I don't think we need to go into it, but look up any set of statistics that speak about basic doctrines, the real presence, uh, birth control, abortion, celibacy of priests, the divorced and remarried, women priests, homosexuality. These are all basic points of the church's doctrine and morals. And you find striking numbers of Catholics who don't hold what the church has always held. Right. So that is a loss of faith on a staggering level. We also see a loss of vocations. So people who are just, they're just not giving themselves to the religious life, to the priesthood. Many religious congregations have disappeared. Buildings are getting sold off. Uh, there was a time not so far distant in the church's history where a diocesan bishop didn't know what to do with a new priest because he had too many priests. And we have the exactly the opposite. Priests are, are few and far between. So a tremendous loss of vocations. We also see that the very highest authorities in the church seem to be acting many times in uncatholic ways. So just to mention a few examples, we have the interreligious prayer meetings of Assisi, where supposedly um, these different religions prayed together as if they believed in the same things. And this is a, a scandal, and this is against the, the, the commandment that says you, you love the Lord your God above everything else. And even, even non-Christian religions were represented there. So ones that didn't even believe that Jesus Christ was God. Uh, so this is, but this was sanctioned by the highest authorities in the church. Again, we see the popes, recent popes, uh, giving marks of veneration for non-Catholic and even non-Christian religions. For example, the popes who have um, kissed the Koran the, the Holy Book of Islam, a book which explicitly denies basic doctrines of the faith of, of, of Catholicism. So this is this huge problem here, a huge scandal. More recently, we have uh, Pope Francis's actions, in particular, the Pachamama statues, which is, again, very much like Assisi, Amoris Laetitia, which seems to contradict such a basic doctrine of the faith about who can receive Holy Communion, we have the Abu Dhabi Declaration, which seems to state that God has positively willed that there be false religions, which would be against his wisdom and his goodness. Uh, these are all examples of recent popes who have done things that are, frankly, un-Catholic and scandalous. So mm -hmm. that is to say, telling people the opposite of what they should be hearing from the highest authority in the church. Finally, we have the admission, the explicit admission of recent popes, the very popes that have uh, celebrated many of the changes, the admission of these popes that the church is 
in such a state of crisis. And I'll just mention three quotations. First of all, um, Paul the Sixth. So this is 1968. It's a mere three years after Vatican II has closed. And he says, the church is in a disturbed period of self-criticism, or what would better be called self-demolition. The church is destroying herself, says Paul the Sixth. That's a state of crisis. You can't deny that, right? John Paul II in 1981, we must admit realistically and with feelings of deep pain that heresies in the full and proper sense of the word have been spread in the area of dogma and morals. So heresies in dogma and morals, that's, that's in the church, you know? So John Paul II admits, Benedict XVI, one month before his election to the papacy, so this is 2005, what little faith is present behind so many theories, so many empty words, how much filth there is in the church, and even among those who in the priesthood ought to belong entirely to him, Lord, your church often seems like a boat about to sink, a boat taking in water on every side. And that's a very strong quotation Mm. to say that even the priests have this filth. Even the priests are leading people astray. And so, again, here we're not trying to make any judgment about what this crisis is or where it came from, but do we admit that there is... Right. this disease in the church. And I think we have, in face of all that evidence, we have to say, yes, <laughs> there is. Right. Um, right. What do we say to those who have never thought about this? They say, well, uh, wow, I never, I never considered that. Well, I think it's getting harder and harder for anybody to be in this position, unfortunately, especially with the recent actions of Pope Francis. Um, but we have to remind everybody that Uh, Catholics are first of all called to believe the Catholic faith. And we see this in baptism, the traditional rite of baptism. What do you ask of the Church of God? Answer, faith. That's the first thing the baby, the adult to be baptized asks is faith. And we see in the Athanasian Creed, um, whosoever will be saved before all things it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Which faith, except everyone do keep, whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. So we don't have an option. We have to open our eyes and we have to see uh, that there are things we meet with in the church which are frankly not the Catholic faith. And I think that to those people that haven't yet examine the situation it's time to it's time to look a little bit because it's a question of our faith we have to we have to hold to the faith um we also mentioned that some people can say well um there's not a crisis in the church because well nah, everything's just fine everything's great it's the new springtime in the church there's i think the only this people, natural progression of things it's yeah natural progression not causation. um right. yep we're shaking off the dead wood uh dead branches dead leaves but um the only people who really hold this sincerely are the progressives so those who say openly that they wish to break with the past so it's not possible for us to hold this position because uh the faith is being abandoned by many souls and that faith cannot change in its essentials. If you don't think that, then you're not really holding a Catholic position. That's the bottom line. Um, Even John Paul II spoke of a silent apostasy that was going on. This can't be something that we're okay with. We have to, we have to face it. Um, I'm going to cite a few times during this uh, podcast uh, Monsignor Gherardini. So he writes a book uh, called Vatican II, A Much-Needed Discussion. I find him a good source 
outside of the SSPX, but clearly trying to face the situation uh, honestly and sincerely. Okay. Um, he sums up the situation of the crisis as follows. He says, and he's just he's just listing things. So he says, well, there, there have been the signing of insane agreement, agreements like that on justification, which was a, a declaration agreeing with Luther's position about justification. There has been frenzied ecumenism, official declarations of the saving efficacy of non-Catholic professions of the Christian faith and even Judaism. How many times the very men into whose hands Jesus had entrusted the sacred deposit of the faith solemnly and pompously said no to this or that doctrine, like the Marian co-redemption, because otherwise it will prejudice ecumenical dialogue. It was as if to say there is no other truth or value besides ecumenical dialogue. And so in the name of ecumenism or whatever it is, we sacrifice everything that's specifically Catholic. And that's how he sums up the crisis. Uh, so it, it, it really is, it's, I think it's impossible to get out of this conclusion that there is a crisis uh, in the church today. Right. Makes sense. It, it's, it is striking. Uh, you mentioned this, this quote here, this ecumenism, this frenzied ecumenism. Um, we did, again, we did episodes on this, but everything was done in the sake of this new doctrine, quote unquote, of ecumenism. Right. And it's right. just, it's striking. Right. And that we'll, we'll see in this, in this next question as well in a, sure. in a bit more detail. But as you said, we've, we've done the episodes on them already. So, right. Um, so if we say, yes, there is a crisis now, it's necessary for us to look into it more. Well, what, what sure. is its nature and where does it come from? And so okay. the second question is, well, is the root of this present crisis to be found in Vatican II, the, the errors that we see there, or the ambiguities we see there, and the Novus Ordo Mise, and in general, the liturgical reform. Now, there are some other answers to this question besides yes, obviously. And I would point out that this is usually the, uh, this is usually the point of contention. A lot of uh, people who are conservative in the church they're willing to admit that there's a crisis, but they don't go as far as the society goes in saying where that crisis came from. And for that reason, they say, well, either no, the, the root of this crisis is not, in fact, uh, in Vatican II or the Novus Ordo Mise. It's in some other thing entirely. And they, they might, you know, fill in the blank. It's because of um, the 60s, the, the sexual revolution. It's because of uh, technological advancements. Now we have internet. That's really messed everybody up. Uh, the world is just getting worse and worse or governments or I don't know what. Fill in the blank, right. some other cause. Another way to say no to this is to say, well, Vatican II and the liturgical reform are involved but it's not the fault of those in themselves. Rather, it's the fault of bad interpretations of what the council really wanted to say or bad interpretations of the liturgical reform or something along these lines. In other words, this position would be, the, as, as had been discussed on the podcast, the hermeneutic of continuity. We, we cannot say that there's been uh, any kind of break or, or differing position. And so Vatican II is irreproachable. It's only afterwards that it's been hijacked. And we have to look at the current situation and interpret it using the key, which is continuity. Everything has to be in continuity, period. Okay, so this, so is, this is a, a, the argument often of people who say Vatican II was fine. It's the right. it's the problems in implementing Vatican II. It's the abuses yes. that took place. Let's go back and reinvigorate Vatican II. Let's yes. dive into the spirit of Vatican II yep. and see what's really there and pull out the good from there. Exactly. That's that's the argument, and that's fairly common. Yes, um, fairly but, common, and even compelling because sure. there's the hidden fear that if I say Vatican II is at fault, I've right. somehow denied the infallibility 
that's in the church, or I've somehow said that the church can break with her past, and and so on and so forth, right? We we, we can see that that's not, and we talked about in the episodes why that doesn't follow, but uh, that's a tempting position for many. Right. And it, it, here again, I stress we're not going to say everything, but we want to say why we hold that there are very compelling reasons to see the source in Vatican II itself and the okay. Novus Ordo Mise. So let's let's dive into that. Why do we answer this question with an affirmative? Why do we say, yes, it's Vatican II, or the difficulties, the errors in Vatican II, and the liturgical reform, the Novus Ordo Mise, that are responsible for the appalling uh, lack of faith that we see, lack of vocation, so on. Uh, the very first thing we can cite here is actually the testimony of the popes after Vatican II. <laughs> and what have they done? Well, they have justified some of the reforms or scandalous doings or sayings. Uh, they have justified them by going back to Vatican II and saying, I'm just doing what Vatican II told me to. And I think this is a very strong point that's overlooked by mm -hmm. uh, those who speak to about the hermeneutic of continuity or, or whatever. And that is that, well, now you pretty much have to say, uh, Paul VI, John Paul II, uh, whatever, you're wrong that that's Vatican II. <laughs> so you're the highest authority of the church and you're wrong about the council that was just a few years before you, you came on the scene. And that's kind of a surprising position. I don't think they realize that. So let's get into that. Um, we'll mention just a few instances because these have come up in the podcast. First of all, uh, John Paul II on the Assisi prayer meetings. So again, these interreligious prayer meetings. Here's John Paul II himself speaking. And we can maybe in the, in the video put up the exact citation. I, I don't have to read all of that. Yep. But uh, he says the following. The event of Assisi can thus be considered as a visible illustration, an object lesson, a catechesis understandable by all of the presuppositions and signification of our commitment to the ecumenism and interreligious dialogue recommended and promoted by the Second Vatican Council. And he goes on to say, all authentic prayer is inspired by the Holy Ghost, who is mysteriously present in the heart of every man. And again, is there a way you can interpret that, that the Holy Ghost is the source of all authentic prayer? Of course. But mm -hmm. then to say that about Assisi, as if the Jews who are there, or the Muslims, or the whatever other religions are there, are praying by the Holy Ghost— that's, it's, it's not possible to say that. You, you cannot right. say that. It's, it's wrong. It's false. So, But notice how he goes back. He says, this is an object lesson, understandable by all, and it's just Vatican II. That's it. It's Vatican II. Right. Uh, second example is this um, interreligious dialogue that goes on. And here we have um, Pope Francis uh, remember signing the Abu Dhabi Declaration, the interreligious declaration, where he was saying that even these other religions, false religions, he didn't call them false, I call them false, uh, are uh, willed by God. Positive, they seem, he seems to be saying they're positively willed by God. So it's a, it's a scandalous statement. And, uh, but he explained afterwards what he was doing. And he says this point. Um, from the Catholic point of view... The document, so the interreligious declaration, the document does not move one millimeter away from the Second Vatican Council. So Pope Francis is saying, I signed this document, yes, but the doctrine in the document is the same as Vatican II. Well, we have a problem with that doctrine. <laughs> it's not Catholic. Therefore, right. we have a problem with Vatican II again. Final example here is uh, religious liberty which was uh, something Archbishop Lefebvre was really scandalized by, especially the, the, this effect of the, the secularization of Catholic nations. So specifically going to nations who, had, uh, who were holding Catholicism 
and taking out Catholicism from the constitutions of those nations. This was done at the request of the Holy See and in the name of Dignitatis Humanae, the Declaration of Vatican II on religious liberty, the dignity of the human person. For example, specific example, um, the Italian president at the time, Andreotti, he summarized uh, a concordat that was elaborated with Vatican officials, a concordat which separated the church and the state in Italy, and he summarized it as follows. This is what he said. In principle, it is the surrender concluded in a reciprocal manner of the concept of the confessional state according to the principles of the Constitution and in harmony with the conclusions of Vatican Council II. So why is the state being secularized? Because Vatican II said to secularize the state. So again, if you have a problem with saying that the state should not recognize Catholicism, even when historically it did, then you have a problem with Vatican II. Okay, so... These are, this is our first very strong point in favor of saying, you know what, we need to go back to Vatican II because even the popes and, and the Holy See, it seems to be justifying un-Catholic behavior by Vatican II. But a second point in our argument, and that's what we spend a lot of time in these episodes on, is that with our own eyes we can see the novelties and the doctrinal errors that are present in Vatican II. And we always come back to kind of three major points here. Uh, first of all, ecumenism. Secondly, religious liberty. And thirdly, collegiality. Those are the ones that I want to kind of focus on here. And I'm just going to give a kind of uh, this side, that side. So quotation from Vatican II, quotation from a pope or uh, authority before Vatican II. And we see, again, there's an opposition, there's a disagreement. So first of all, ecumenism, here's what Vatican II says in the document Unitatis Redintegratio. Uh, this is number three. So he, it says, the Catholic Church uh, has separated brethren in separated churches. It follows that the separated churches and communities, as such, though we believe them to be deficient in some respects, have been by no means deprived of significance and importance in the mystery of salvation. For the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as means of salvation. So, the separated churches, non-Catholic non religions, they are important in the mystery of salvation. And they have been used as means by the Holy Ghost. Means of salvation. At best, it's an ambiguous statement, but I think it, it really flies in the face of, of previous statements. For example, Leo XIII in Satis Conitum, encyclical, he says the following, The Church of Christ, therefore, is one and the same forever. Those who leave it depart from the will and command of Christ the Lord. Leaving the path of salvation, they enter on that of perdition. So, to the extent that you enter a uh, non-Catholic religion, you are outside of the Church of Christ, you cannot be said to be on the way of salvation. But Vatican II seems to claim that those separated churches are in the way of salvation. They are means of salvation. So this is a, a, a contradiction. Right. Second point about religious liberty we see a few things here, primarily in Dignitatis Humanae. First quotation from Dignitatis Humanae, the human person has a right to religious freedom. Okay, but substantially, <laughs> substantially, it's equivalent to the following statement, quote, liberty of conscience and of worship is the proper right of every man. That's from Pius IX. Unfortunately, he was condemning that. He was saying right. that statement is false. So Pius IX in Quanta Cuda and the attached syllabus of errors uh, says, no, there's not a right to um, whatever 
religion you want. Okay, so this is a first problem. Second problem, dignitatis humani again. Quote, the, this right of the human person to religious freedom is to be recognized in the constitutional law whereby society is governed, and thus it is to become a civil right. So it must be a civil right that you have a freedom to pursue whatever religion you like. But Pius IX condemned the following statement again in Quanta Cura. Quote, liberty of conscience and of worship should be proclaimed and asserted by law in every correctly established society. That's false. Right. So again, it, it's, it's the same statement, really. Uh, right. Same statement. Right. Uh, final example from um, Dignitatis Humanae. Uh, religious communities also have the right not to be hindered in their public teaching and witness to their faith, whether by the spoken or by the written word. And, and it goes on. So in other words, religious communities have to be able publicly to profess and speak to their own faith. But again, Quanta Cura uh, says the following, a right resides in the citizens to an absolute liberty which should be restrained by no authority, whether ecclesiastical or civil, whereby they may be openly and pub ab sorry, may be able openly and publicly to manifest and declare any of the, their ideas, whatever. And that's condemned. So again, the same statement just shortly before Pius IX is saying those statements are wrong. They're false. Mm -hmm. and, but we find those statements substantially in Dignitatis Humanae. And uh, just finally, as a quick aside, very, there's a reason why Pius IX is, is making all these statements and is doing yes. the syllabus of errors. It's because these errors were starting to become common at that time. Exactly. And then we yeah. find, what, 50 years later? They, they enter the church, yeah. Even, yeah. even a little further than that, uh, uh, more than 50 years, but they come up in modernism and then Pius, Pius X yeah. fights that. And then, and then, of course, they enter in Vatican II. Uh, finally, I'll just mention very briefly collegiality. Um, Vatican II in uh, Lumen Gentium asserts that um, bishops receive jurisdiction immediately from God at their Episcopal consecration, but that goes directly contrary to what Pius XII had taught. So he says, uh, quote, the power of jurisdiction which is conferred directly by divine right on the Supreme Pontiff comes to bishops by that same right but only through the successor of Peter. And so difference, uh, I think um, uh, Dom Tranquilo had, had spoken about this a lot. But anyway, uh, so collegiality, we mentioned that there too. After this, we have to also mention the liturgical reforms because we claim that the Novus Ordo Mise, the liturgical reforms are again, a part of the difficulty here. And um, Archbishop Lefebvre, would put it this way, he would say that the, the new mass represents, a, a, it seems to be the expression of a new religion. And that's something, again, we defend that statement of the archbishop, and we hold to it primarily for three reasons. Uh, you'll find this in any classical critique of the Novus Ordo Mise. So a reduction or elimination of the propitiatory character of the sacrifice of the mass. Secondly, the confusion of the priesthood of the priest and the priesthood of the faithful. And thirdly, a diminishment or attack even against the real presence and transubstantiation. I don't think we need to go into all of those reasons again. We've done that in, in great detail. Um, but we should mention once again, the creator of the new rite of the mass Anibali Bunini, who says very, very clearly what he is doing. Quotation, the prayer of the church should not be a cause of spiritual discomfort for anyone. It is necessary to push aside any stone that could constitute even a shadow of risk of stumbling or of displeasure for our separated brethren. So translation, we have to make the Catholic right Protestant. And we agree with Bugnini that he succeeded in doing that. Right. As far as I know, more conservative Catholics that think the Novus Order is not a problem tell Bugnini that he has failed in his goal, right? That, that would be their position. They would say, no, it's still a Catholic right. But we say it's not a Catholic right. Bugnini succeeded. 
He made it Protestantized. Can I make just a quick observation? And I'm just yeah. thinking of this, so maybe it's it's not fully formulated here. Uh, in my mind, it's a total mistake to ignore what the people behind the, you know, the church people behind the Second Vatican Council and the formulation of the new mass. It's a mistake to ignore what they say. They tell yes. us exactly yes. what they're doing. Yes. Uh, you don't have to really look a whole lot further than that. Yes. I mean, we've seen that through this whole last section. They tell us what they're doing. Yes. Why are we ignoring That's right. it? That's right. Yeah. And I think we do have to pay attention to those statements because, as you say, they, 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 they're they putting their cards on the table. It's not it's not a hidden right. thing at all. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think we do see that. Um, as a final point here in, in justifying our position that we have to go back to Vatican II for the mistakes. We have to go back to the liturgical reform for the for the source of this crisis. Um, we can mention uh, that uh, again. This uh, Monsignor Gherardini. I have a couple of very striking quotations from him with regard to Vatican II. And again, I think this is uh, important because we see other people besides the Society of Saint Pius X coming to some of the same conclusions. So here's what he says. This is a little bit of a longer quotation, but he's speaking about religious liberty. He's examining it in the much-needed discussion. And he says then this question, Is it possible then to subject dignitatis humanae, so declaration on religious liberty, to the hermeneutic of continuity? Question. So can we use the hermeneutic of continuity with dignitatis humanae? And he says this, and he kind of hedges here a little bit, but then he comes down very strongly. He says, if we settle for that which is rhetorically abstract, then yes, on the level of the historically concrete, however, I do not see how this is possible. And he continues, and the reason, he says, is self-evident. The freedom covered by the Declaration Dignitatis Humanae does not regard an aspect of the human person, but its essence and all of its individual and public activity. This has little or nothing in common with Mirari Vos of Gregory XVI, Quanta Cura and the attached syllabus of Blessed Pius XI, Immortali Dei of Leo XIII, Pascendi of Pius X, Lamentabili, Humani Generis of Pius XII. It is not a question of different language. No, it is a substantial difference and therefore inflexible. The content of Dignitatis Humanae and the contents of the previous magisterium are different. So there is neither continuity nor development of the previous magisterium in Dignitatis Humanae. That's an extremely strong quotation. Wow. Uh, because even if he admits that you can twist language, that's why he says rhetorically abstract, we can play the sure. language game, but in the concrete, no, there's no possibility of, of error. They're different. So there's no continuity here. It's very striking that he, that he says that. Another quotation from him is uh, on ecumenism. So he speaks about um, the, the um, unitatis red integratio, and he, he asks this question now, so what is the Protestantism that is described in this text? Because the text speaks about this, again, approaching our separated brethren, bringing the Protestants back into unity with the church and so on. But he asks, well, what, which Protestantism is it? There are so many. What are we talking about? And he goes on, he says, abandoning this uncertainty in the text, the post-conciliar movement was not stingy in giving attention to anyone and everyone. All were welcomed, as if a principle and foundation of a new mint had been established, namely the inclination to reach out to the world, the absorption of its joys and its hopes, not to mention its contradictions. And he concludes, the outcome reached by this acquiescence to the world continues to openly parade itself and in the final analysis shows itself to be, if not of necessity, a betrayal of Christ, at least a rupture from venerable tradition. And so there he says the same thing again. Continuity? Not possible. There's a rupture here. There's a break. And uh, again, that's Monsignor Gherardini. 
Uh, we see the same thing about the Novus Ordo Mise from the famous conclusion of Cardinals Ottaviani and Bacci in the Ottaviani intervention. Uh, I don't think I need to give the whole quote again. Maybe we can put it there. But they basically conclude that this new liturgy represents a striking departure uh, from the traditional Catholic theology and understanding of the Mass. So they also see a departure, a break. And so our point here is that if in Vatican II itself there are statements that are erroneous statements or other statements that are at least ambiguous, and we find, we find all of those. We find true statements, we find ambiguous statements, we find erroneous statements. But if they are really there, and if these statements lead to the loss of faith, then that's the cause of the crisis. That, that they do lead to the loss of faith, I think, is evident, because as soon as you say, let's open our arms to all the religions, all the religions are good and means of salvation, well, then nobody needs to convert. Why, why would right. you convert? And then we can pray with everybody and it's fine. And why would I give my life for bringing people to Christ if I can, if they can be saved in their own religion? I don't need to become a priest. I don't need to become a religious. I don't need to become a missionary. So we see that same effect. And then if the mass is now a meal, a supper, uh, a Protestant rite, well, Jesus Christ is not present there. So the real presence is emptied. We see that loss of faith in the real presence again. So... All of these things, there's a direct connection between what Vatican II has said and where it has gone. And more than that, we have the popes telling us that that's what Vatican II meant to do. It meant mm -hmm. to go in that direction. So it, it's kind of hard to escape this conclusion, in my opinion. Uh, we, had, we had mentioned at the very beginning of this question um, that there were some other replies to this question that somebody could give. They could say, well, no, it, it's not, the root of the crisis is not Vatican II, it's not the liturgical reform, it's it's some other cause completely, right? Uh, technology, um, uh, the world, you name it, right? Fill in the blank. This just doesn't hold water, and it doesn't hold water because it cannot, that answer cannot adequately explain the nature of today's crisis and why we are in such a crisis. It's a failed explanation. How is it, we could ask, that the elements of the world can cause such a wholesale abandonment of the faith, not only among lay people, but even within the hierarchy? And if that's the case, why didn't they cause such of that across the entire 2,000 years of the church's history? The church right. has always been fighting the world. Why is it now that the world seems to have such a stranglehold on so many people in the church? Again, not because of the world itself. You have to look for some cause within the church. So this position, I think, is, is very untenable. An another answer was this question of the hermeneutic of continuity. We have to um, see these as just misinterpretations or whatever. We go back to the spirit of the council. And again... I think it's very hard to hold this position when the highest authority in the church is sanctioning and participating in uncatholic behavior and then justifying it by saying that's Vatican II. So <laughs> it seems like there's no room for for this um, you know misinterpretation to come about. And then we can even push the push the question further. Um, well, if it if we need some special hermeneutic to kind of special glasses to wear to read Vatican II to avoid this this monster that is the misinterpretation of the council that everybody has fallen subject to, of what value are those texts at the end of the day? Right. We're going to need another text that states the Catholic faith clearly and specifically saying this is what it is and that's what it's not. End of story, period. If you need a textbook um, to help you understand what the textbook it, is saying, then right. maybe the original textbook is a problem. Right, exactly. That's that's the that's the point there, and and the same problem with the Novus Ordo Mise, right? What, um, how can we say that it's just the celebration of the right that has this effect when we find these harmful elements within the right itself, within the very very uh, codification of the right and the general instruction of the Roman Missal? Uh, final point that we can make here is. Who did this? Who hijacked the council 
managed to twist it around completely and make it so that it was entirely falsifying the true spirit of the council. Um, and, and when? When did it happen? Because again, just just very, very shortly after the council, Paul VI is saying, we have a huge, huge problem in the church. And and even it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, there's no time, there's no possibility for somebody to, 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 to hijack this. Um, and again, the very authorities at the council itself, we see them saying uh, the things that, that, um, are the errors, right? Are the problems. So I just think here, the hermeneutic of continuity, it just, it's not possible. It's a good theory. It's a good guess. It's a good attempt maybe, but it fails. It fails in the face of every single fact that we can produce about the council itself and about what happened after the council. So that's our kind of conclusion regarding the second question. We say, and we think we've defended that the roots of this crisis, of the faith, of vocations, of everything, the roots of this crisis are found in errors mentioned in Vatican II and the problem of the liturgical reform. Yeah. So, question wow. three. <laughs> All right, Question three. And again, that was the longest section because that's really where the, the right. battles happen. Uh, sure. Question three is, is quite a bit simpler. Now it's a question of, well, do we publicly reject the errors of Vatican II and the Novus Ordo Mise, or um, should we not do it publicly? Maybe we just keep it private. If yes, um, if we agree, yes. If our answer is yes to question two, what do we do about it? Yeah, yeah. Basically. What do we do about it? Um, that's another question. We, we, where do we go from here? And um, that we'll deal with partially in question four and then partially in, I think, the the last episode is like, well, what's the yeah. solution to all this mess? Right. Um, but then should we do that? Should we publicly do that even if we come into conflict with the authority? Uh, that's our question. So again, possible other answers. Well, it's just no. No, we, we've got to keep it private. The authority is the authority. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, maintain an ob obsequious silence. Uh, just, you know, don't don't talk about it. Uh, privately, in the sacristy, um, with a couple of faithful that you really trust, you can you can say, hey, I have these grave reservations about Vatican II, but don't say it out loud. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, we answer, the society answers, yes, we have to publicly state what is the truth and that these are errors. And why do we say that? Because these are the errors that are the root of the crisis today. They are the cause of scandalous behavior. They are damaging souls. They are taking souls away from the true faith, without which faith we cannot please God, says St. Paul. And so we cannot be silent where the faith is at stake, where the faith is being attacked, uh, and to the detriment of many. It Because we are Catholic, we want everyone to be saved, but the way to be saved is to be Catholic. And so we have to defend what it is to be Catholic, not because we're proud that we are the few elect, but because we want everybody to have that. We want everybody to be Catholic. That's the only way that they're going to be saved. Jesus Christ said, uh, unless they believe and are baptized, they can't be saved. And and so we have to go, go preach to all nations, go make them Catholic, right? That's the idea. So we have to uh, publicly speak against these because it's the faith that is being publicly attacked. Now, obviously, uh, each individual, um, that's going to look different for them. For a layman, it doesn't mean you have to start your own blog and start blogging about these things. That's not, that's not it. But again, for priests, for bishops, they, their responsibility is greater. The priest has a responsibility towards the souls that he's caring for, the bishop towards his priests and towards the souls in his care. And that's why um, Archbishop Lefebvre um, saw his public resistance to these errors as his duty. It was his duty as a bishop of the church. And he says that, I, I, I think it's in the, um, the 1988 consecration sermon, uh, consecration of the bishops there, and where he says that um, I, I, I'm just a bishop. And as a bishop, I have to hand on what I received. And that handing on means I have to condemn what is opposed to that. And I have to show you what is true. 
That's my job mm-hmm. as a bishop. A bishop has to teach. So our answer to this question is is a resounding yes. We have to be public about this. Again, everybody's what each person does is going to be different. And that's getting into the question of, well, what's the solution of this crisis? And we'll go into that in the uh, in the next episode, I think. Um, the other position that says, no, 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 let's keep everything private. Let's, uh, you know, maintain a certain silence because after all, these are the authorities and so on and so forth. Um, well, we saw this together actually in a lot of detail in the episode on obedience. And it just doesn't stand here uh, for two reasons. One, because there are practical consequences of action based on this position. Um, you have to, you have to say yes, sir. I agree with everything in the council. The Novus Ordo Mise is good and valid and licit, and everything's great about it. I have to say those things, uh, you know, in order to do certain things in the church. But if I don't think that that's true, and I think these things are destroying the faith. I have to speak out against that, I, and that would be public. But the second reason I can't just keep a silence and keep everything private is that this um, benefit of the doubt and this keeping things private, it's not an unlimited thing. When it's a question of public scandal, you have to speak. And that's what um, St. Paul did with St. Peter. He he resists him to the face, but that was a public response. and. Uh, the, the explanation of St. Thomas Aquinas, I think we, we spoke about it or mentioned it in the episode on obedience. Um, he comments that this was the right action for St. Paul to take. He had to do it publicly and manifestly to correct Peter's public mistake. And so, no, there can be situations in which we speak out, and this situation is, in fact, one of them. So, answer to question three, yes, we must publicly respond to these errors. Okay. So those are the those are the first three questions about the crisis. Now we get to the last one, which again we've talked about some of this before. But right. uh, the main the main point is the main question is should Pope Francis be recognized as Pope? Given this, yes. if we answer yes, yes to these three things, yes, what do we do about the the people who are saying these things? Yes, exactly. So that's right. That's the question, and. Um, should, should we continue to recognize them as the authorities? Uh, should we pray for them in the Mass? Should we go to Rome and talk with them? All, all these are, are the questions. And again, uh, we're gonna, the society is going to say yes to this. Okay. Um, there are other possible responses uh, that say no. And I think we can more or less sum those up in two positions. Some people say, no, we shouldn't because the person who calls himself the Pope is not the Pope a- at all. And some say that of Pope Francis, some say that of the Popes since Vatican II. This is all the set of vacantist position. So the seat of Peter is vacant. There is no real Pope on that seat right now. And they say that for a number of reasons. Uh, again, we went into a lot of detail there in the other episodes, but they claim, well, by saying these things, he's a heretic, so he loses his office. Um, They say these things because they say, well, he could never say them if he were pope because he's infallible. Uh, Many reasons. Or they simply criticize the society because we pray for him as pope. We say in the mass, in the canon of the mass, una cum, right? So we are are together with Pope Francis and we, we name him in the mass. And they say, you can't be together with him. You don't even agree with him. Right. So all these are various positions that falls under the umbrella of set of vacantism. Um, another position, which uh, is very recent, is a kind of thought that uh, Pope Benedict XVI is still the legitimate pope. So Pope Francis is is not the pope. And I think there are different flavors of this, too, as to how they explain uh, how this is. But they say, no, we don't recognize Pope Francis because Benedict is still the Pope. So that's another way to answer this last question, this fourth question, no. Um, why do we as a society say yes to this? We say yes for two, uh, broadly for two reasons. The first reason, the first set of reasons are theological reasons. And they're the background or the foundation for the second set of reasons, which are, we might say, prudential or practical. 
And I want to emphasize that I think this came out in the episodes on, on set of vacantism and some other questions that the idea that there are some, some questions involved in this detail questions of theology that have not been definitively solved in the history of the church. And we don't claim to solve them right now. And that, that's, right. that's important. It, we don't, uh, we don't claim to have all the answers to all these detailed questions about what happens if a pope does this and this and this. No. What we come back to is the doctrine that we know and basically, uh, essentially, the key principle that we always come back to on a theological level is that the church is a visible hierarchical society. Visible means not just that you can see members of the church, uh, like you or me, uh, but that you can see uh, the church is a society having a hierarchy and having a head. And when we look at um, Catholic apologetics before Vatican II, or when we look at um, arguments against Protestants, this was always the point that Catholics were coming back to. We can point to the head of the church and the head of the church is the church's foundation, as as uh, um, Christ himself says, you are Peter upon this rock. That's the foundation. And if at, at a time there, there would cease to be such a head or a foundation, it seems that we would be in a situation where we lose the visible hierarchical society that is the church. And I, I'm oversimplifying there because... We've gone into a lot of detail, but basically the theological reason comes down to that. Um, if we don't know the people that are the church, the church is not visible. And right. that, that's a problem. That's a, that's a problem that the set of vacantists would have to solve, would have to respond to. Um, I said that this was kind of a foundation then for a prudential or practical consideration. And for that, I just want to go back to... Um, Archbishop Lefebvre, and simply cite him, because there's been no change, really, in the society's view of this position since Archbishop Lefebvre outlined and, and clarified it. And um, I know there was a comment uh, at some point, somewhere, maybe on this series, maybe somewhere else, I think this series, that w w one of the persons is saying, well, you should mention that Archbishop Lefebvre held the set of vacant disposition at one point in his life. And I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and maybe he didn't say right. that, but that was what I, right. that was what it sounded like to me. But the answer to that is no, he never held the set of vacant disposition. He did consider it though. He did look at it and say, wow, I really have to think this through. And he did think it through, and he concluded that, no, we cannot hold this position. And so that's what I'm going to cite right now. Um, he, says, um, he says this, first of all, in a letter um, written to a friend in, in 1984. It's quoted in his, his biography by uh, Bishop Tissier de Mollere. So he says this, quote, um, One has had to live from 1960 to the present moment to discover that popes can lead the church to her ruin. Such a thing seemed impossible to us, given the promises of the Holy Ghost's assistance. Contrafactum non fit argumentum. Against the facts, there is no argument. The facts are there before our eyes. So we have to conclude that when our Lord spoke of help until the end of time, he did not exclude periods of darkness and a time of passion for his mystical spouse." And that's basically what we come down to. This is his summary of the position. Um, wow, we never thought this was possible, but there it is. It's happening. And so it must be that our Lord's promise includes these periods of darkness, this mystical passion uh, of the church, right? Um, mirroring the founder, the, the um, Christ himself, mirroring right. his passion. And so uh, Archbishop Lefebvre takes a very prudential position— and I'm going to cite a few more things here from him. So he says this. Um, this is again quoted in the biography. Um, we are faced with a serious dilemma, which I believe has never existed in the church. The one seated on the chair of Peter takes part in the worship of false gods. So he's referring to a Sisi there. 
What conclusions we will have will we have to draw, perhaps in a few months' time, faced with these repeated acts of taking part in the worship of false religions, I do not know. But I do wonder. It is possible that we might be forced to believe that the Pope is not the Pope. So that's his consideration of set of vacant as we say, wow, right. we might have to take this position seriously. But then he says right after that, um, a little bit later, excuse me, he says, it seems to me initially, I do not yet want to say it solemnly and publicly, that it is impossible for a pope to be publicly and formally a heretic. And so there he's saying, well, this, this is a position we're going to have to wrestle with this, we're going to have to see. But he always, after that, it's very clear, he chooses his line, he, he is very clear about where he's going, and it's not the set of vacant disposition. He always returns to the dogmatic truth that we said is the foundation, the church's visibility, the visibility of the, uh, of, the, of the hierarchy. And then he comes back to the practical necessity that we have to remain attached to Rome. That is to say that um, eternal Rome, obviously, but that implies a, um, a concrete recognition of the Roman authorities. Where is the solution going to come from, if not from the head of the church, right? So that's kind of, the Archbishop has said something like that, I'm paraphrasing. So um, <clears throat> here's what he says further. Here's what the Archbishop says further in, in line of that position. He says, first, the visibility of the church is too necessary to its existence for it to be possible that God would allow that visibility to disappear for decades. So he comes right back to the foundation. And then practically he says, the reasoning of those who deny that we have a pope puts the church in an inextricable situation. Who will tell us who the future pope is to be? How, as there are no cardinals, is he to be chosen? Our fraternity, so the Society of St. Pius X, absolutely refuses to enter into such reasonings. We wish to remain attached to Rome and to the successor of Peter, while refusing his liberalism through fidelity to his predecessors. And that is the position, uh, has always been the position of the Society of St. Pius X. Um, and I think that, that that leads to the way in which um, the Archbishop had always acted during his life, the way he had uh, gone to Rome to discuss things, presented himself to Rome to say, this is the truth, this is what we have to do. That's what the society has done since then. Uh, it's a consistent position. Um, and I'll just maybe conclude with this, a final letter from the Archbishop to friends and benefactors. He says this, um, the basic principle of the society's thinking and action in the painful crisis the church is going through is the principle taught by St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica, that one may not oppose the authority of the church except in the case of imminent danger to the faith. The society acts on the assumption that Pope John Paul II, that was the time period, Pope John Paul II is Pope and so prays for him and strives to bring him back to tradition by praying for him, by meeting with those around him, and by writing to him. And so that's very clearly the position of the society. We say, yes, we have to recognize them because otherwise we get put in a dogmatically questionable position and a practically impossible position. How can we ever get out of this crisis if not, uh, if we don't say that the church is still a visible hierarchical uh, organization, that person's the authority. We pray for him that he come back to tradition, that he see what, what's going on and that he clearly state what it is. So that's how we uh, answer this. And kind of in response to the to the other positions, um, the set of vacantist position, uh, we've kind of gone into that in a lot of detail in the other episodes. Maybe if we need to address individual questions, we can do that in a, in a question and answer period later. I think sure. largely we've kind of responded to them. And um, I, I think there's not a whole lot more to say here. Uh, 
more to say would be detail about the question of popes and heresy, about the question of uh, the una cum. It obviously doesn't mean that we agree with him in everything that he says. That's that's not what it means. Um, the question maybe of uh, infallibility, but those are all a lot more detail. I think we have to come back to um, what's essential here, which is the visible hierarchical organization of the church and the practical solution to this situation, which is found in, in still recognizing these Roman authorities. And it um, is interesting. You mentioned this a little bit already, Father, but yeah. there is, this is, this is totally new. Um, a lot of these, yeah. instead of economism as a general position is a relatively new position yes. in the church. Um, and there are lots of theologians throughout history. I mean, Bellarmine, for one, he disagreed with other theologians at the time about yeah, exactly. whether or not the Pope could fall into heresy and exactly. how that would work. Yeah. And and it is interesting, and I'll just bring this up, and I, I, I'd like to talk about this in a future podcast, maybe a Questions with Father episode or something, but there is disagreement on some of these things Absolutely. among priests, among theologians, even among priests of the Society of St. Pius X. On some of these questions, there are some disagreements. It doesn't mean that, you know that some of these priests are outside the society or not no, Catholic or anything no, like no, that, no. but there's room for, this is all relatively new and we don't have all the answers and we're not professing yeah. to be yeah. the, the answer here. Yeah. And, and I think that, I think that, um, what Archbishop Lefebvre would say, what the society has always said is that this is not the time to enter into detailed, abstract theological discussion based on what, has been a disputed position in the past. We have to, as the Archbishop said, we have to stay concrete. We have to stay realistic. And what's realistic is that the church has to be visible. She has to right. be a visible hierarchy. We can we can never lose that. And um, how that fully reconciles with the crisis of today is part of the mystery of the crisis. That's not that's the mystery of this passion that the church is undergoing. The Archbishop speaks about that, but also practically speaking. How on earth are we going to make any progress? But look at the progress the society has made by holding this position, the the um, lifting of the so-called excommunications, the uh, freedom of the mass from Summorum Pontificum, the, the spread of the traditional mass, the protection of the mass, the sacraments, everything, the priesthood. I mean, these are tremendous achievements, and they've been achieved because we keep witnessing to Rome Say this is the truth, you know. Th right. This is the answer. This is the this is why there's a problem, and so on. And that's that's the position of the society. That's what we need to keep doing. And um, I don't think any society priest disagrees with that. Uh, we may have we may have discussions about about you know theological disputes, but but on the level of what we're supposed to do right now, we're we're clearly in line with uh, Archbishop Lefebvre. That's for sure. Absolutely. Um, I want to mention just very very briefly the other position. Um, Benedict is still Pope. That was the other way to say no, don't recognize Pope Francis, it's Pope Benedict. Um, I think we could, if there's more to say here again, maybe it could be a question and answer, but bottom line for me, I'll just say it uh, right out, uh, this does not help us at all. And I, I realize that's not a direct answer to their arguments, <laughs> but right. it helps in no way whatsoever. Benedict XVI is part of the problem. And in one, in one sense, he's actually worse than Pope Francis because he gives the appearance of being more conservative, but he still accepts uh, at, at its root the errors and the difficulties of Vatican II. So I don't yeah. know what that gets us by saying Pope Benedict is still the Pope, except to put us in uh, a, an impossible situation without actually solving any of the crisis. Um, so that's just my, it's a little bit of a flippant remark. I realize that. Uh, maybe we can go into more detail later, but I don't see that that um, position can really help us here. Uh, Thank you for saying that. I thought I was crazy thinking in my head that maybe Benedict the Sixteenth was worse in terms of the crisis in the church than Pope Francis was. Is yeah, uh, yeah. I would say I would say worse in the sense that, uh, of course, he did many things that were good for tradition, right. but worse in the sense that he did all that without without ever saying that the problem is Vatican II. The problem is the Novus Ordo right. Mise. But Pope Francis is very consistent. He says, Vatican II said this, and I'm only following Vatican II. I'm just following Vatican II. That's all I'm doing. And right. he is really the most consistent Pope I think we've had since Vatican II in terms of the conclusions and consequences of the errors we see there, for sure. Right. Yeah. 
Well, Father, this has been this has been great. Thank you for taking uh, the time to kind of wrap up this whole series in great. this one You're concise um, statement. Um, this has been this has been excellent. And again, I'll. I'll I'll let the listeners know if you're if you're just listening and not watching um, on the YouTube video, we have all the uh, links to the various episodes and we've marked on times, you know, where you can find more information on those things. Um, but just go to SSPXpodcast.com slash crisis and you'll find all the episodes there. It's all there in more detail if there's something you want some more detail on. But Father, thank you for taking the time on a it's a Friday evening when we're recording you're this. Welcome. So thank you yeah. for taking. I'm sure you had plenty of other uh, parties to go to and. <laughs> while the night's planned instead of sitting here talking with me but more, you know. <laughs> more like sermons to prepare and stuff like that oh, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah for sure but thank um, you for taking the time too you too and father our, um i would love to chat with you some more uh we're planning other series uh as we get towards 2022 here That's right. um and you and i've been talking a little bit maybe a sneak yeah. peek here about possibly doing something about saint thomas aquinas and the summa is that what we're thinking yes yeah that's uh, we're bouncing ideas back and forth. Um, I've been talking to Father Franks a little bit about it. Um, I know you've been in on on that discussion too. And um, the idea started with this that I think a number of priests have kind of been asked at one point or another. I know I have, um, or I've heard people say, "Gosh, I I sat down with the Summa Theologica and I decided I was going to be a good Catholic and read St. Thomas and." <laughs> I just don't understand. I just got it's lost hard. on the yeah. first few pages or whatever it is. And so one one idea was maybe we can do some kind of a series with um, <clears throat> just reading the Summa. And I, I don't know what, I I have so a lot of questions about this. I don't know if it's going to materialize, but uh, I guess if anybody has any thoughts about that or, or anybody thought that was something wanted, maybe something like that already exists. Uh, if you if you have information about that, just to the viewers or the listeners, um, you know, throw it in a comment or shoot an email our way, and we can kind of take that into consideration. It would be kind of an exciting project, um, yeah. a demanding one, but we'd need to definitely um, aim at a, at a specific audience there. Sure, sure, certainly. Well, Father, thank you again for taking out the time on welcome, this episode man. and the other ones you've helped us with. Uh, it's been great. So have a wonderful week. Thank you, Andrew. God Thank bless. You. Thank you for listening to and watching episode 48 of our Crisis in the Church series here on the SSPX podcast. We were just going to have one more episode left with the Superior General of the Society of St. Pius X, Don Davide Pagliarani, but that would mean we'd only be at 49 episodes, and that's just a weird number. It felt incomplete. So to round it out, no, that's not the actual reason, um, but to round it out, we will have an interview with Father David Sherry next week. And he's going to give us some practical guidance, basically answering the question, what can I do about the crisis? Then in two weeks, we're going to go a little bit further with the same sort of question, and we'll wrap up the entire series with Father Pagliariani answering the question, what is the solution to the crisis? Please consider subscribing to the podcast and to the SSPX News English YouTube channel so that you won't miss these or any of our future ones. And if you have the ability to set up a monthly recurring donation of $5, 10 or $20 on sspxpodcast.com, it would help us immensely as we embark on several new series that will be starting in 2022. Until next week, thank you for listening and God bless you.